Hey guys, my name is Mike and welcome to my new channel, It Could Have Been Worse. If all goes well, this channel will highlight the near misses and tragedies that have taken place throughout world history. There is, of course, no shortage of disasters that occur, and there are some absolutely fantastic videos that really highlight these accidents. But what about the disasters that almost happen? Those are moments where world history would have been very, very different if not for that one brilliant stroke of luck that saved untold lives. That's what we're going to highlight on this channel. And we'll start with the story of 601 Lexington in New York, otherwise known as the City Corp Center. This gorgeous Manhattan skyscraper leaves one of the most indelible marks on the New York City skyline. And in 1978, it almost changed the face of New York City when an architectural error and failure in calculations almost knocked the entire building over. 601 Lexington, as it's now known, resides at 53rd Street between Lexington and 3rd Avenues in Manhattan. It was built in 1977 to serve as the new headquarters of Citibank and contains more than 1.2 million square feet of office space. It's 59 stories and 915 feet tall. The building is best known by its roof and its trademark sloping 45 degree angle. It is extremely visible on the New York City skyline. But there were problems with the building right from the start, or namely one of its neighbors. Meet St. Peter's Lutheran Church, which occupied the space just next to the City Corp Center. Its presence interfered with the construction of 601 Lexington. So a negotiation began. In the end, the church agreed to allow developers to build them a new church on the same site, one that wouldn't interfere with the new building. This led to more than a few design changes, and ultimately led to a crisis that could have killed up to 200,000 people. Here's the deal. Originally, architect Hugh Stubbins and engineer William LeMessure planned on putting four columns on each corner of the building. Pretty standard stuff. With the church remaining, that wasn't possible. So instead, they moved the columns, shifting them to the center of each facade. As you can see, the building is cantilevered, and this unique design allowed for the church to remain directly underneath the building. Now, New York City can get relatively windy, and the buildings had to be designed with that in mind. So, LeMessure designed the building with stacked chevrons that would absorb the force of the wind into the supporting columns, allowing the building to withstand the hurricane force winds that occasionally blasted New York. That didn't address every problem, though. The building could still sway in powerful winds, and I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like my idea of a good time. To reduce the swaying, a tuned mass damper was added to the top of the building. The goal of the damper was to absorb the energy of the wind and reduce vibrations. This damper would enhance the structural integrity of the building and ensure that the building didn't sway as much in the wind. However, the damper only works if the power is on. And that becomes important later. At the time, New York City Code required that all buildings be built to withstand wind that comes from the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. LeMessure had made this calculation and determined that his building could easily withstand powerful hurricane force winds coming from these directions. But what if the wind came from a diagonal direction? Meet Diane Hartley. In 1978, Hartley was an undergraduate student at Princeton, studying engineering. As part of her undergraduate thesis, Hartley had to study a unique piece of urban architecture. She chose the Citicorp Center, which was then just a year old. And that was when Hartley made the terrifying discovery that the building was not safe, and thanks to its unique architecture, could fail if it was hit with strong enough quartering winds. Hartley spoke with her professor, David Billington, who encouraged her to contact LeMessure directly. There are conflicting reports about whether or not Hartley spoke with LeMessure himself or a junior staffer. Regardless, the information did get to LeMessure, LeMessure said he believed the building was safe. However, upon recalculation, he realized Hartley was right. The reason? It goes back to those chevrons. Remember them? They were designed to absorb wind and drive the energy of the wind into the building's four concrete columns and its central core. However, if hit with a quartering wind, a potential problem emerged. 
LeMessure's design originally called for welded joints to attach the chevrons to the building. These joints, manufactured by Bethlehem Steel, would have maintained the structural integrity of the chevrons in the highest of winds. However, unknown to LeMessure, a design change had been approved by his company that opted for cheaper, bolted joints. Such a change resulted in a 40% increase in stress to the joints, still survivable. But if hit with strong enough winds, the stress could increase by 160%, enough to topple the building. And the problem was made worse by the tuned mass damper. It should have assisted with distributing the wind throughout the building, as long as the power was on. But if the power failed, the damper would actually swing wildly, exacerbating structural problems. And when was the power likely to die? In high winds or hurricane conditions, pretty much the last thing that the building could survive. LeMessure's calculations held that this sort of event happened once every 10 years. This, of course, was a catastrophe. It needed to be addressed, or risk as many as 200,000 lives and potentially wipe out a large chunk of Midtown Manhattan. The disaster forced LeMessure to report the issue to New York City. There were conflicting needs that needed to be balanced. The need to protect the public, fix the building, and avoid a massive panic. The plan was hatched. LeMessure and Citicorp worked on a massive plan that essentially hired every welder they could find. The welders worked in the dead of night when no one was in the building in an attempt to hide the repairs from the public. The fix was easy enough, if not labor intensive. Heavy steel plates would be welded over the bolted joints. This would give the chevrons the strength they needed to survive heavy quartering winds. Then came Hurricane Ella. Ella was a monster of a hurricane ultimately hitting Category 4 with sustained winds of over 140 miles an hour. And for a few days in early September 1978, it appeared that Ella might turn into the city. This prompted more action. The New York City Police Department coordinated with the Red Cross on an evacuation plan of a 10-block radius that incorporated 2,500 volunteers and countless emergency service employees. With Ella creeping up the coast and the city bracing for impact, in more ways than one, all eyes were on the hurricane. Would it hit the city, or would it swerve out to sea? Thankfully, Ella turned east, away from New York. Ella wound up being the largest hurricane ever to make it to Canadian waters, and had it hit New York, it is very possible it would have generated the winds necessary to knock over the Citicorp Center. Thankfully, the work was completed, Citicorp was deemed secure, and life went on. Here's the wild thing. Somehow, someway, this never went public. I know, it sounds impossible. But no one heard about the crisis that could have killed up to 200,000 people until a 1995 article in the New Yorker called the 59-story crisis. It didn't hurt matters that there was a major newspaper strike at the time. Amazingly enough, among those who never heard about the crisis, Diane Hartley, the engineering student who actually found the fatal flaw and potentially saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Hartley heard about the repairs in a documentary that aired later on TV. In an interview, Hartley said that she almost dropped her son when she heard the story. And it wasn't until 2003 that Hartley's role in the story became public. On the plus side, since that day, the building has not had a single serious incident or safety violation. In 2016, 601 Lexington became an official New York City landmark. It continues to operate today and is now owned by Boston Properties. The incident has become a storied case in engineering ethics, with many arguing that LeMessure did, and didn't, do the right thing. On one hand, he copped to his error right away and immediately launched the actions necessary to fix it. On the other hand, he never went public. And this raises the question, if you worked in that building, or in the shadow of it, wouldn't you have wanted to know about the potential issue? This leads to two main lessons. First, manage the process. The measures firm approved the changes to the bolt design without his knowledge. Now, on a massive project, one person can't be expected to know every in and out, but surely something was missed for such an important design change to have been made without the appropriate safety checks. Yes, process-related issues like this are boring. Really, really boring. But they're important. 
all of the human resources stuff about org charts and workflow, they exist for a reason. This is one of them. Second, and maybe this is me getting on my soapbox, maybe all government regulations aren't bad? To be clear, La Measure did meet all necessary governmental safety regulations. However, that's just it. The regulations weren't strong enough since they only required La Measure to calculate the strength of the wind from cardinal directions, not the diagonals. This oversight nearly resulted in the toppling of a skyscraper and a death toll that could have made 9-11 look like nothing. Strong enough regulations might have prevented this near miss. There are greater ethical questions here too. Was La Measure right to remain silent about the actions? Was anyone? It's a highly, highly debatable question, but it is worth noting that LeMessure did listen to Diane Hartley, a random engineering student whose calculations may have saved countless lives. By being open to the criticisms and concerns of others, LeMessure was able to save the building and many lives along with it. That's all for now on It Could Have Been Worse. I hope to have another video for you in the next few weeks, and I really hope you enjoyed this one. If you did enjoy what we had to say, please hit the like or thumbs up button, definitely click on subscribe, and make sure to click that bell so you get notified whenever we release new videos. Until then, stay safe out there.